I mean, we'll we only have an hour, right? So. Yeah. You want to get going? Yeah, right, you so want we'll to kick us off? Right, yeah, why don't you, okay. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I know there's some folks coming in. Um, there's not a lot of space. There's a couple of, there's, you want to come sit over here, anybody? Um, there's some people at the door. Uh, there's, well, there's something on that chair. Come there's in if you can. Front here. There does appear to be one up front. Um, all right, so so we're going to get started. Um, this is uh, this is really kind of more of a, a workshop type presentation, uh, and the goal here is at about a beginner slash intermediate level for us to give you a run through of the really core tools and some of the techniques that you want to use to verify digital content. So a lot of social content, whether it's um, things like uh, tweets or videos being shared, um, or things just like websites. Uh, and so we're going to take you through four case studies. We'll detail all the tools in each case study, but we're also going to show you how they're being used. So you get kind of a practical demonstration. We'll leave time for questions. Um, Josh, why don't you introduce yourself? All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Josh Stearns, and I uh, am the Director of Journalism and Sustainability at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, where I run a series of experiments through what's called the Local News Lab on creative revenue strategies for local news and community engagement. But a couple years back after the Boston Marathon bombing, I got really interested in the um, flow of social media around misinformation and also the kinds of emergency contact and uh, critical information that people need in the moments of disaster and how we can make sure the trustworthy information is finding people. At the time, I didn't know much about verification of online content, uh, but I became obsessed with it. So obsessed that I started a website called Verification Junkie. Uh, verificationjunkie.com, where I've started to review and track tools for verifying social media content. We'll be talking about some of those tools today, but there's far more on that list of directory, at that directory at verificationjunkie.com um, about, that you can use. So there's a lot more there than we'll even get to today. Uh, and my name is Craig Silverman. I'm the editor of BuzzFeed Canada, um, and prior to joining BuzzFeed, I've spent a little more than a decade um, researching and writing about errors and verification uh, in journalistic settings. Uh, I edited the verification handbook for the European Journalism Center and have done a lot of, as I say, research and writing in this area. Um, and so Josh and I are both part of a coalition called the First Draft Coalition, and this is an organization that has been put together and funded by Google of lots of different people and companies and organizations who are all very interested in news gathering using social media, verification using of social media and other kinds of content, and also thinking about the ethics around the use of social media and journalism. Um, so they're the folks that help bring us all here to do this, and uh, First Draft has a website that you can check out with lots of tools and tips and tutorials. So why don't we get started? I'm going to go first. All right, I switched microphones. I'm sorry, I'm messing with them. <laughs> Can we turn this one on now? Because I'm going to stand up. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, so I mentioned we're going to do four case studies. One of them is on verifying video. One is on verifying images. We're going to talk about how you find people online because at the core of any verification challenge is finding the source, talking to that person, figuring out where it came from, who they are. Verifying location, um, and also, you know, there's so much uh, incorrect and outright false information online that we're also going to do a case study around verifying a suspected hoax. And so with each case study, we're going to show you the tools we're using, and then we'll just do a quick summary at the end to remind you of which tools, um, and, uh, and we'll be happy to take questions. So I'm going to do the first case study here, uh, and this one is looking at verifying images. So. Um, this is uh, one that I did when I was doing a research project for Columbia University about a year and a half ago, um, where I was trying to look at viral news and figuring out how much of it was true, how much of it was false, and how kind of rumors and claims would originate somewhere and morph and move around the internet. And so this is an example of one that I looked into. And I also just want to preface it by saying that um, you know, I've covered it up, but like some of the material, there's, there was a bit of nudity in it, but I've covered it up. So I just want to say that I'm doing this case study not for the nudity, but for the importance of the actual case study. I probably sound like a North American prude right now, right? Okay. So this was where it started. This was an article in a British tabloid, and the basic story was that there were two Russian women who went out in the street one day, got naked, had a snowball fight, and then got fired from their jobs. Um, as a result of this. And so this is what they claimed. And you know, there were two pictures here. There's another picture on the next part here. 
Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to figure out, okay, did this actually happen? Because a lot of times when something originates in one country or in one language and then crosses that language and geographical barrier, things kind of get lost and messed up. So what do we need to do to figure this out? Um, so on the next one here, um, and I'm going to go through each of these. If you don't know what I'm talking about yet, don't worry, we're going to go through it. But these are the steps that I knew I needed to take. So one is I was going to reverse image search all of the photos. Because the photos are really the core of this piece. Uh, and I want to figure out where else online these photos were. And if possible, I want to find the very first place that they appeared online. So I'm going to do what's called a reverse image search, which I'll show you. Um, the second thing is, with these photos or any other versions of these photos that I find, I want to see if there's any metadata attached to them, meaning is there anything that tells me about when they were taken or where they were taken, what kind of camera they were taken with. Because with digital images, that's embedded when the photo is taken. Now, unfortunately, most of the time when a photo is uploaded to uh, a content management system or especially to social networks, the metadata is usually stripped out, if not all of it, some of it. Uh, and so you don't always get lucky with exit data, but in this example, I'll show you when it's really useful. Um, and then obviously, we have the text of the story, the central claims of it. And in this story, it listed the two names of the women, and it also listed the name of a photographer. So I'm, I'm going to check those names. And then the last thing, of course, is you know, when you're doing verification, you want to find that original source of it. And so that's the big thing is, like, can I find that photographer? Can I find the women? Can I find anybody else involved in it? All right, so reverse image search. This is, without a doubt, one of the most useful verification tools that you can put in your toolbox. Um, and let me also note that every single tool that we're going to talk about here is free. Now, there's a couple of them where there might be like a premium version, but everything at the most basic level is free, and none of them require extensive technical expertise. So that's why, again, this is like beginner intermediate level, but you can do so much with free tools online. Uh, and so this is reverse image search for Google. There's a couple other services, which I'll tell you about in a second. Basically, you go to the Google Images search page, you click on the camera here, and then it gives you a couple of options. So now we have the option to paste in the URL of where the actual image is, or we can upload the image from our computer. And what this does, again, is it's going to search on the internet, search in Google's image database, and it's going to show us the links of where this photo shows up elsewhere. So sometimes if it's original photo and hasn't been anywhere else, you get no results. Um, and, and I should be clear, like, just because Google gives you no results, it doesn't mean that absolutely it's nowhere else online. It just means in their database it isn't. But this is a really great first step with any kind of photo. Um, and if we go on the next slide here, there's an amazing plugin. If you use Chrome, it's called RevEye. And what will happen is you can right click on any image and it gives you the option here. Because like Chrome, as by default, gives you the Google reverse image search there if you ever right clicked and didn't notice that before. But RevEye gives us Google, gives us Bing, gives us TingEye, Tin-I, which is a, uh, a reverse image search specific. That's all they do is reverse image search. We also get um, Yandex, which is good for searching um, for Russia, and Baidu, which is good for China. So if you want to search all of those, it's going to open up a bunch of tabs. It's going to show you that. Um, and in this case, you know, I did the search. And with Google right away, I managed to find um, a Russian language story that predated our English language story that used the same images. So here it is. Um, and, and again, on the next slide here, just to note, what's really important again is, um, is the date. So the English language article is published in April. The Russian language article is published in March. So it predates it. And that's the earliest that I had found it published, earliest that, that I could find these images online. So this most likely um, is sort of where this was perhaps first noticed by the people who ended up doing that article. Now, it's possible it's been other places, but this is the sort of lead that I had to go on. So um, in, the, in the Russian language article, one of the things um, that I need to do, obviously, is translate it. So if we go to the next one, we see what it looks like when it's translated. So um, a couple of things stand out here. The first thing is the Russian language article, and this is using Google Translate. The Russian article makes no mention of them being fired or working in a department store. So that's a discrepancy. The second thing is that it names a photographer. And the photographer named in this article is different than the name given in the English language one. So we have another important discrepancy. And also, this one doesn't list the names of the women. So we have the two names of the women in that one that are not in the original. The photographer's name is different. It says nothing about them working in a department store, nothing about them getting fired. So we know that there's probably there's some problems going on here. 
and we need, need to figure out which version is true. Um, and so what I want to do next is I want to search for the names of these photographers and sort of see if I can contact them. So I go with the one in the Russian language version, guy named, goes by the name Gene Oryx. Um, this is another tool that I'm using here. Up in that right-hand corner, again, it's a, a plugin for Chrome. It's called Storyful Multi-Search. And you can type in a name, and it's going to search Instagram, Spokio, Tumblr, Twitter, Twitter images, Twitter videos, Vine, and YouTube. So instead of me having to go to each of those places separately, I pop it in the box once, and it's going to open up a tab for each of those searches. And this is just one of the examples of a result. This was a result for a Twitter search. And what comes up is you know, a photo kind of in the, in the style of, of what was there in the story, and also a link to a 500 pixels uh, profile page, which is a photography community. OK, so that we're starting to seem like this guy might actually be a real photographer. He does a lot of shoots like this. That seems somewhat probable. I searched the other photographer's name, the one in the English language article. And you can see on that, really the only thing I get are that English language article and the people who copied it after. So there's nothing that immediately from Twitter and other searches tells me that this is a photographer who has a presence online, whereas the one in the original Russian article seems to have that. Um, and so on the next one here, we can see, I also, of course, you know, we searched Google, and we can see this is, it was Dmitry Kulishenko was the name of the one in the English story, and the only results really for him came around people copying that story, except there was a guy who was the head of IT infrastructure um, at, uh, at some company. So there, there are men named that, but I didn't seem to find a lot of photographers. Whereas with the other guy, again, if we look for his Google results, um, on the next slide here, we see that he's got tons. And we also see, again, he's got photos that kind of fit with this. He does these kinds of shoots. So I'm going to reach out to this guy. I'm going to get in touch with Gene Oryx um, through his, his, his photography account. Um, and then I also found like his own website. And so I email him, and I'm like, hey, I'm trying to figure out, is this story in the Daily Mirror true? Um, it, or is this Russian one true? What's going on here? So he, he emails me back. He says, hey, that English one is false. He links to the one that I had found. He gives me the proper name of one of the models, says the other one didn't want to share her name. He's the photographer. And the beautiful thing he does, and I, I didn't even ask him to do this, is he attaches a copy of one of the photos. And this is a high-res version of the photo. So the ones on the website are you know, small. They're compressed. Um, the metadata has been stripped out. He sends me one that's, I think it's like a megabyte, so it's relatively high-res. And, the, and so, one, he's showing me that he has high-res versions of the photos. But two, this is where I can do my EXIF data. So let's go to the next slide here. Um, this is a tool called Jeffrey's EXIF Viewer. Again, EXIF data is embedded in digital images. It can tell you things about the image when, when it's been taken. And because this is, appears to have come direct from his camera, it's telling us things like, you know, he's put his name in there, the type of camera. It tells us the date when it was taken. It tells us the flash was off. Um, it shows, again, the file size is pretty big. Now, one caution I just want to say about this is people can actually manipulate metadata. So it's not like a foolproof thing. Um, and this is an important note for verification as a whole that, you know, Sometimes you do get a smoking gun, but a lot of times it's like pulling a bunch of different points together and looking at them together and sort of seeing what the story tells you. But in this case, you know, he's given me a high-res image. Um, he's in the, in the earlier version of the article. Um, his name is there. You know, he gives me information that contradicts it. That original article contradicts it. So everything is telling me that this, his story and that original one is credible, and there are big problems with the Daily Mirror one. And so you can see there, from the use of a few tools, all free, not a huge amount of time taken to do this, we could figure out that there's a lot of problems with the Daily Mirror one. So let me just quickly review the tools that I went through here. So these are the ones that were in this case study. Reverse image search. Um, so you can go do it in Google Images, or you can install RevEye, which will give you access in Chrome to a bunch of reverse image search. And again, this tells you where else that image is online. Really, really useful. I use reverse image search all the time. Google Translate, you know, a lot of times you're dealing with stuff online that gets translated, that gets taken, aggregated, so that's a really useful one. Storyful Multi Search, another Chrome plugin, and this is going to give you a really fast way to search a name or a keyword if you want across a bunch of different platforms, and I'll just open them in separate tabs, so it's a great time saver. Um, Google Search was also used to sort of see their names, um, where else they appeared online. 
And then we did an exit viewer once we had an image that seemed high res where we thought, where I thought, hopefully there's metadata in this. There should be. And then the last one is email, which, you know, you have to talk to people. Um, so don't forget that. Email, phone, Skype, really, really valuable verification tools. All right. So that's our first All case right. study. Thanks a lot, Craig. And uh, you'll hear that refrain again about going back to basics a little bit in, in this conversation. So uh, a couple months ago, the New York Times, CNN, and a few others, um, it was actually not the New York Times to be fair, it was an AP story which the New York Times ran online, fell for a fake eyewitness um, in the San Bernardino shooting. And I've got a video here, let's see if it plays with volume. Can we get the audio on the computer? Uh, I've got another way to do this, hold on. I know you were across the street when the shooting started, but you just didn't see anything. You first realized something was going on. Uh, Marie, can you hear me? I think we just. Uh, yeah. Uh, Marie, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hey, Marie, you're on the air. It's Anderson. You can hear Anderson Cooper uh, grappling with this eyewitness, and you can tell there's a couple sort of giveaways in this. Um, so a couple times Cooper asks questions that are really relevant and, and that an eyewitness should probably have seen, and when the eyewitness stumbles, Anderson Cooper kind of fills in the blanks for the eyewitness, kind of letting the eyewitness off the hook. Um, Anderson Cooper, you could hear kind of nervously asking some questions there, but... Um, but throughout this, the eyewitness only reports things that had already been reported in the press. Um, and there was a number of times where the eyewitness walked back things that they had said over the course of this. So how did this Mary Port, as they went by in the Anderson Cooper interview, but we'll find went by different things later, prank the media, as they went on to say on Twitter a few days later? Um, so... How did, we, how did this happen and how can we avoid this happening in the future? Uh, there's a, a number of ways that we can go about doing this. Uh, number one is this all started on Twitter. So she was on Twitter, um, they were on Twitter, we don't actually know the, the gender. Um, they were on Twitter saying, I just saw this shooting. And really quickly, if you look at the original tweet, there's just this litany of reporters who have reached out to them asking for information, asking for interviews, that sort of thing. What those journalists, for the most part, weren't doing were going back and looking back at the other tweets that were happening. They were reacting in the moment. They thought they had a great lead, um, and they were acting on that. But if you look back at past tweets, you can look back at how active the account had been. Um, were they posting anything that seemed out of the ordinary, that, that, that wouldn't have fit 
sort of them being in that place at that time. Um, did they even mention San Bernardino before ever, before this tweet ever happened before? Um, and you can see here, Brian Reese said that the, the person's timeline is really trolly, which I don't know if we can define trolly, except that it gave him a bad you know, feeling about the, the tweets. And then uh, Malachi Brown, one of our colleagues in the First Draft Coalition, also talked about um, the fact you know, that this person did have a real social network, um, but there was no, no history of San Bernardino. Um, there was just seconds before this tweets about Gamergate and gamers and stuff like that. Um, and then a reference to the shooter shooting people uh, seems like an odd, almost removed way to refer to things. So there was some hints in the tweets right away. Um, to look at past tweets, one of the really great tools is Twitter advanced search. And it's amazing how many people don't know about Twitter advanced search, because Twitter is kind of buried. But it's a hugely re uh, resource, or huge resource for looking into these things. Um, so here you can see I've highlighted, you can look for San Bernardino, you can look for the account, and then you can actually geo look for it for geotagged and set a date um, limit to your search. So there's lots of ways you could tweak those different fields to really grill, drill down into this. Um, you can also search for sp other specific words in different ways. And then this list here is something you can find on Twitter. It's actually an operator uh, search so that how to ask the right things and how to search the right way within Twitter's basic search as well as other things is really useful. And I can also tweet that out after this so that you can get a copy of it. Um, Another thing is obviously just check the bio and their social footprint. So are they using their real name? Um, a lot of people were concerned by the Twitter handle here and the fact that actually in some press she was going, they were going by Mary Port and in other things uh, they went by Mary Parker. So really, right away you've got them giving different names to different press, a huge red flag. Uh, do they have a home lo or location listed? Can you dig into uh, a website that they have, just the way that Craig found somebody through their 500 pixels website? And can you track them down on other in social networks? This is where Storyful multi-search comes in really handy if they're using the same name or same handle across other um, places. And then who do they follow and who follows them? So in addition to Storyful multi-search, I wanted to mention two other apps. Um, I find Mention Map really interesting, and they have, um, they're actually going to be releasing a new version soon. But Mention Map allows you to see who the person's talking to and what they're talking about. So it maps really conversations and people, which can be really useful in getting a sense for who this person is surrounded by and what sorts of things they're talking about. Um, so that's my Mention Map, a snapshot of that. And then for Follower Wonk, I actually did Craig's follower account because he's much more interesting than I am um, in terms of who follows him from around the globe. And Follower Wonk actually does a whole bunch of other things um, to really dig into who your followers are. So you can put in anybody's name. I put in Craig's here. And you can really get a sense for who follows them. And that tells you a lot about the community uh, and their social footprint. So then you can get to know the area. Um, you'll hear that in the Anderson Cooper clip, uh, Mary Port couldn't really describe the area, didn't really know. It was, oh, oh, they were going into the hospital, right? Like not knowing the name of the building, that sort of thing. Um, a couple things stuck out to Steve Buttry, a journalist who was watching this unfold. In the International Business Time, uh, Mary Christmas, as they were quoted in this article, said um, she lived in La Puerta, California. But if you search, there is no La Puerta, California. Uh, there's some La Puerta businesses uh, near San, in San Diego, and there's a community named La Puenta, but if anybody had searched that before, you know, including that in the story, they would have found that something was amiss. Similarly, um, another journalist questioned the description of events. Merry Christmas, in this case, said that they were across the street, but if you look at a Google map of the area, it actually doesn't really lend itself to that. So here I did a Google image search of the building, and here is a Google map of the building, and you see that um, across the street you're either in a field, but this person said they were hiding behind a building. Uh, it might have been across the street sort of to the south of that, we don't really know, but the, the, when you started to map it out, the story that they were giving the crest wasn't starting to make sense. So that's a way that you get to know the area um, and you can sort of get a sense for what the story you're hearing and how accurate it is. Getting back to the sort of old school techniques, just picking up the phone, a lot of journalists actually tried to get this person on the phone and they said that they didn't have a phone, but they were tweeting constantly. 
So when somebody asked them about this, they said, oh, well, I, I have a phone, but I'm on Wi-Fi. Uh, but they were moving constantly, they said, as well, which you would think they would lose the Wi-Fi signal. So that was a red flag that nobody could get them, this person on the phone until uh, later when Anderson Cooper got them on the phone. And uh, so no one could verify. And a lot of journalists, if you look at the interviews after this, gave up after this. Just said, if I can't get this person on the phone, I'm not going to put them in a story. Um, and then, obviously, I've shown you there's a, a whole bunch of red flags were put up around the course of this reporting. And at, in the end, a lot of times with verification, you go with your gut. And if you can't get the kind of verification you need to run something in a story, you may just need to wait, and that might be the right thing to do, because waiting sometimes, as you saw, some of the journalists who did wait were very glad they did not include this person in the story. So just a quick tools review, Twitter advanced search, um, and you can get that through Twitter if you go in um, to the, I actually have it bookmarked because I just want to get to it really quick, but in the settings you can get down into the Twitter advanced search. Uh, mention map and follower wonk to really begin to analyze someone's social footprint. Uh, Google Maps and Google, Google Images and Flickr results are really useful for getting a sense for what's happening where if you're not a local journalist yourself and don't know the area. And I will say this case study you can find at bit.ly slash fake eyewitness and I'll tweet out a, a copy of that from my Twitter account soon as well. Uh, but this is all written up there. And we'll also, we'll also make the presentation available too. We'll tweet that out um, so you can keep an eye for that. All right, so we're on to number three of four. This one's about verifying video. Um, so here's the video. It was uploaded to YouTube a while ago. Uh, and this is a case study, by the way, that was done by the, the good folks at Storyful. So I'm going to walk you through that. Um, the link to it is down there. Uh, but again, we'll share the presentation. So um, there's a video uploaded to YouTube. It shows a woman kind of filming a really crazy thunderstorm in her backyard. And then all of a sudden, uh, a lightning appears to strike a tree in her backyard. She jumps back, yells, oh shit, walks back in the house. So it's a pretty wild video. Sparks come off the tree. And because I work at BuzzFeed, I made a GIF, if you want to show them that. Here we go. Boom. There we go. See, um, just a piece of trivia, your first two weeks at BuzzFeed are all about GIFs. That's all you do. <laughs> um, you, wanna, you might want to verify that. Oh, okay. So we'll keep going. Um, so here's... Uh, so it's uploaded. Um, it's an account on YouTube that you know didn't have a lot of history. Uh, but one of the things we did get was you know the person put their name, and that seems like it might be a real name with it. Um, and in the video itself, it does, she doesn't say where she is. Um, she's not like narrating it for anybody. It was a very natural kind of holy shit moment. Uh, and so what we have is really just a name. Um, and that's what we have to go on. And sometimes you get, get a bit more detail on the profile page of YouTube and you can see previous videos and you could watch those and see where are they shot and maybe there's info. Didn't have that in this case. So we've got a name, so we're gonna go with the name. Um, a great tool called, uh, this is just for the US, um, is called Spokio, where you can enter a name and it's gonna give you a bunch of results. And so for Rita Krill, we got a bunch of different uh, results here in a bunch of different states. And so, like, one option would be to try and, you know, call the people every single Rita Krill here. But we may be able to actually narrow that down a bit more. But, you know, again, we've got a bunch of results ranging in different parts of the country. You can see there a map in the upper corner. We want to figure out, um, can we narrow this down a little bit before I get on the phone and just call every single one of them? So uh, in order to do that, I go back to the video and we look at it. And so one of the things is that the tree that gets struck by lightning is a palm tree. There's a pool in a backyard. So we could probably rule out New York and Pennsylvania. But not a lot of palm trees there, right? And this is one of the big things with video verification is you often have audio. So what are people saying? Is there an accent? Is there a dialect? Um, are they giving you information about where they are? And the other thing with video is obviously paying really close attention to the things you can see in there. Do we have license plates? Is there anything about the style of clothing that tells us anything? Are there street signs, billboards? Any of those things are really, really good clues for you to dig into. In this case, we pretty much, we had a palm tree and we had a pool. Okay, so we're probably going to zero in. There was one result in Florida. That's a very Florida kind of thing. There was also Texas, but I just, we, we decided to start with Florida. Um, so we know that in order for this to be real, there had to have been an actual thunderstorm in the place. So if there's a Rita Krill in Naples, Florida, why don't we see if there has been a thunderstorm in Naples, Florida around the same time that this video was uploaded. So this is another tool you can use. It's called Wolfram Alpha. 
it's a search engine um, that can reveal, that can give you answers to questions, to put it in a really basic way. And so in this case, we wanted to know what the weather was like in Naples, Florida on October 5th. And, and that's all you have to enter in Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha. And then it gives you the report. And, uh, and like you, could, you can enter in anything. You can like put in a date from like decades ago and things like that. And Wolfram Alpha will give you the info. So we know actually, hey, wait a minute. You know, the day of upload, there, there was a thunderstorm in Florida. And just to kind of back that up a little bit, the other thing that the folks at Storyful did was they looked on Twitter to see were people tweeting about a thunderstorm and you know, was there a lot of lightning? And so we see here, here's a tweet, not just from anyone, but from an actual local weather guy in Naples, Florida, telling people, you know, storm clouds, downpours, there's a lot going on. And this was found obviously talking about, you know, rain and storm and the hashtag Naples. And that's how you, you could zero in on that. And again, Twitter advanced search would be a good way to do this. So now we're feeling pretty good about um, Rita in Naples, Florida. There's one other thing we can do, which is, you know, thanks to Google Maps and also thanks to Spokio, we can get a look at the house where they say Rita Krill is. <laughs> We're getting a little bit creepy, I know. But um, so, so this is the result in Spokio. It actually tells us the house that Rita Krill in Naples, Florida lives in. Um, and it gives us the, the address. And so we can see there's that one. Okay, so we, I go to, we go to Google Maps. We see a little bit of a bigger one. And what we have here, so this is her house. We have a pool that's sort of horizontal in the back, which is exactly what you see in the video. And we seem to have a palm tree right here in the corner, which is where it appears to hit. So based on the name, based on the weather in that area, um, the location, and also what we can see from her house, this, this looks like the right Rita Krill. So at this point, we got to get on the phone, call Rita. Um, and so Storyful called her up. They spoke to her. She's very happy to talk about her video. She's very excited about it. Um, and, you know, in this scenario, it kind of goes back to your example as well of the, uh, of the eyewitness. You know, she's talking very emotionally. She's talking personally about the experience. She's excited about it. You know, um, she's talking about somebody who was actually there. And so the way somebody talks about an event as an eyewitness is very important, just to reinforce that. And she even sent along a photo of the tree that got hit. And you can see here, this is what the lightning did to it. Uh, and again, you could run an exit reader on it to see, oh, you know, does it come from the camera she said she took it with, for example. Um, and so, so that's how the folks at Storyful verified that she was the person who'd taken the video. And then in that case, you know, what Storyful does is they would work to kind of clear the rights so that it could go out to their clients to use it as long as she gave permission. So what are the tools in this one? Spokio. You had a question? Go for it. Asking where it was as a comp. Um, I don't know. Uh, like, do you mean, did somebody post a comment saying, where did this happen, and have her reply? No, there wasn't. Because if that had been there, then that would have been, in, you know, part of their workflow in sort of checking that out and seeing her reply, but uh, no. Some people upload stuff to YouTube and don't think to go back and reply to comments, um, but in this case... Yeah, oh yeah, you definitely want to look at the comments, and like I said, you know, you want to go to that person's profile and look at their previous videos to see what kind of stuff have they been uploading, and does that tell you anything more about who they are and the location? Um, you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, one of the things you run into a lot on YouTube, especially with breaking news videos, is scrapers who have scraped videos. We saw this uh, most recently with Brussels, where there was scraped videos from past uh, breaking news events that were circulating as if from Brussels. Uh, and so by looking at people's past history, you see, oh, this is just somebody who scrapes videos every time there's breaking news and circulates misinformation. Great. Strike that off the list. Um, but that history piece is important, but they also create fake accounts to do that. So, you know, there's... YouTube you know, is tough. That's why I think digging into some of this stuff gets useful. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta find the person. Um, like that's, that's a really, really key thing about this, uh, particularly with video. There's so much video that gets taken and recycled and put out of context. It happens with photos as well. And that's why reverse image search and kind of tracking it down and figuring out the first uploader, the first person to talk about it is really, really core. Um, so Spokio is the people search tool for the U.S., which can sometimes even give you an address and an image of their house. Uh, yeah, I know, it feels weird to say that. Um, Wolfram Alpha is, uh, is a search engine where you can get information about the weather on a certain date, 
Um, it's also useful for like calculations. You can basically ask it questions um, and ask it for information and, and it will spit that out to you. Uh, Twitter search, again, to just sort of see where people in Naples, Florida talking about thunderstorms to figure out, um, again, if we can back up the idea that this kind of weather was in that area. Google Maps was useful to compare against um, Spokio and to get a larger picture to sort of see does the geography of that supposed house of hers match what we see in the video. Um, and then the last thing is getting on the phone. Uh, and in this case, you know, she sent an image. Um, they probably would have also asked for the original video file, I bet, in some cases, uh, and, and to get your hands on that. And anyone who is the person should be able to provide you with all that information. Um, so that's, that's a quick video case study. We got one more to do here. And I'm going to move through this pretty quickly because we really want to make sure that we've got time for you to ask questions. Uh, so I've gotten sort of um, obsessed and really interested in hoaxes and the ease with which hoaxes now are being created and spread. So just before Super Tuesday, which is one of the biggest election days in the primary season in the U.S. presidential election, an article started circulating. This was literally the day before the uh, Super Tuesday election that said that Senator Elizabeth Warren had endorsed Bernie Sanders for president. And it looked identical to the New York Times article, and it spread like wildfire the day before, thinking this is great news. Of course, the timing is perfect. Of course, she would endorse him right before uh, Super Tuesday. It makes perfect sense. Uh, the New York Times had to release a statement as fast as they could to say this is not a true New York Times story. We don't know where this came from. We don't know who created it. And we have now sent a cease and desist letter to make sure that this gets taken down. Uh, but in that 48 hours it took for that to happen, the video had been viewed 58,000 times um, and shared on Facebook more than 40,000 times. So you can imagine not all those people who saw that were going to see this New York Times correction that went after it. Uh, too often the hoaxes and rumors travel much farther than the corrections. But in this case, um, the story was still up on the fake website, but it had this little label on it now with this uh, disclaimer. So how does something like this happen and why does it matter? In the, course of Super Tuesday, in the case of Super Tuesday, of course, it could sway votes. It could make people vote for somebody who they might not have voted for otherwise. In other cases, a fake uh, article claiming, it was a fake Bloomberg article that claimed that Twitter was looking to sell itself, made Twitter stocks rise. Uh, it was debunked pretty quickly, but before it was debunked, it actually had an effect on the stock market. Another case earlier, um, the WikiLeaks posted an article that looked just like a New York Times op-ed from the then editor Bill Keller uh, saying, I've been wrong about WikiLeaks this whole time, they're a great organization and they should be treated just like journalists and protected. Um, which was a real change from his past positions. And then finally, um, a group called the Yes Men, who use sort of culture jamming techniques to make a point and to protest, created fake New York Times that they handed out on the street declaring that the war in Iraq had ended when it hadn't. And they passed 40,000 of these out around New York City in one day. It was a huge, huge effort to get this out. So why does this happen and why does it matter? And how can we, how can we avoid spreading these things? In the case of the WikiLeaks op-ed um, from Bill Keller, the, it looked so good that the technology editor of the New York Times shared it on Twitter. And, he, and uh, so you know, there's cases in which like, this stuff is spread and we need to know how to make sure that we're not spreading it as well as help shut down uh, they, them when they come and debunk them. So URL shorteners make this even harder, right? Because they, just, they hide the URL and if you're sharing things without checking the original URL first, you might be sharing a fake. So let's check the URL. In terms of the New York Times um, Sanders article, it was created by a site called Clone Zone. And if you go to Clone Zone, you can see that they have templates there for CNN, Fox News, a number of international media properties. So it makes it really simple for you to just create fakes. Now, in this case, for Clone Zone, they actually run a itty bitty tiny footer on the bottom of the site that says this was created by Clone Zone. Um, but otherwise, looking at it, you wouldn't know that it was a fake, except that the URL has this clone zone language in it. But, you know, most people see a headline and hit share and don't necessarily look at the URL. The URL for the WikiLeaks, um, Bill Keller op-ed, was opinion-newyorktimes.com. Looks pretty legit, but the real New York Times opinion pages are located at this URL. Now, you know, someone who's not familiar with that could be really fooled by that. The fake Bloomberg one was Bloomberg.market, which, um, which Bloomberg doesn't own that, that top-level domain. And these new top-level domains, .limo, um, .biz, a whole bunch of others that are out there now, make this even harder to keep track of who owns what. So when you're checking the URL, 
Um, check for some of those things. Check where these types of pieces usually come from and whether it makes sense. And um, you know, tweaking URLs like this isn't just uh, the practice of hoaxers and fakers. It's actually uh, really common in phishing. And if you're interested in, in phishing that, that can steal your identity, so this is also sort of a safety and encryption and security issue for journalists as well, uh, knowing where you're going online and what you're clicking on. And the Freedom of the Press Foundation uh, at freedom.press has a really great whole guide on phishing and how to avoid it. But you can see here, Charles Blow, a New York Times op opinion writer, uh, said, oh no, I fell for the attack of the clones on my own paper. And so he had tweeted the, um, he tweeted the Bernie Sanders one. Chris Segoyan said, you know, oh look, Nick Bilton, the technology editor, tweeted the, this fake New York Times. And then the Nick Bilton said himself, he tweet, deleted that tweet. So check the style, right? Does this actually fit the tone and style of the place that it purports to come from? So in this case, the Clone Zone article that was Elizabeth Warren was supposedly written by John Jonathan Martin. The byline was an actual New York Times journalist. And he tweeted to them, you know, next time you create a fake, you should know, here's our style guide. <laughs> so in that case, he was able to pick up on right, these nuanced things. Most people might not pick up on those nuanced things, but in the case of the Bloomberg Twitter article, the CEO of Twitter's name was misspelled in the article. So we ought to be looking for these sorts of things. Um, in, the, in that same Bloomberg article, the fake Twitter article, it was attributed to a journalist who covers the UK banking regulations. Um, probably not the person who's going to be reporting on Twitter. So look for those sorts of things, tone, facts, conventions, etc. In the case of the Bill Keller's op-ed on WikiLeaks, Glenn Greenwald um, noted facts in there that he thought were, well, I've never heard those facts before, and I've been covering this stuff for a long time, so what is this? This seems out of place. And then earlier we were saying find out who shared it originally. Go back to the source who first posted it. In this case, looking back, if you looked at Twitter's advanced search and face or Facebook's graph search, you can begin to track down the chronology of who shared it. The first Bill Keller WikiLeaks op-ed shares were from WikiLeaks and an account, anonymous and an account called Block New York Times. Um, giving you a real sense of where these originated from. And then, um, you know, the, they, people can also create fake Twitter accounts. And in the case of the Bill Keller one, there was actually this New York Times Keller account, which was, looked just like Bill Keller's account, except that one of the L's was actually an uppercase I. And you wouldn't know it because it just looked like a line. And so that's how they spoofed a lot of people into retweeting these things that seemed to come from Bill Keller. Uh, so a who is search, how many of you know what a who is search is? So a couple, um, a who is search lets you get at who started, who started the website, who's the register, it's sort of like a deed, if any of you own property, the who is search gets at the deed for the website. Um, sometimes that information is hidden, uh, so there's ways of, dis of not disclosing who you are when you get register a website, but a lot of times it is. Sometimes that's also spoofed. So, um, the who is can be useful, sometimes it, it might not be. In terms of this one, um, the who is search for the WikiLeaks uh, Bill Keller one was actually registered by someone named Ellen Herb, which actually happens to be the same person who registered the real New York Times website. So that was, they actually predicted that someone would look at who is and tried to spoof that. But if you go in, uh, Zenep Tufeki and Chris Segoyan looked back and found out that it was registered at around March 30th, which happened to be the same time that this Block New York Times Twitter account came on board, and a Block New York Times website was also registered on that same date. And then finally, you can dig into the source code, and the source code is really interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, the source code, sometimes pranksters and, and hoaxsters will embed clues and hints in the source code, and actually, you know, that's part of the prank, is like a little funny message that they might leave in there. Other times it's just like this where because this site was created by Clone Zone, there's this digital refuse from Clone, Clone Zone embedded in the source code that you can pick up on. Um, digging in the source code isn't that easy. It's massive. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for. A lot of the times if you look in the headers and footers of source code, the very first bit of code and the very end of the code, you, that begins to give you a sense because that's where you can a lot of times find things like this Clone Zone um, source code embedded in it. And there's a couple different ways to view the source. It depends on the different browser, but if you just look for how do you view source in like your help menu, it'll show you how to view that. So check the URL. Um, that just means going back to the original source and seeing if their URL matches up. Check the style, compare it. 
um, side by side with another piece. Uh, find out who shared it using Twitter advanced search or, or Facebook graph search. Do a who is search, and you can do that from ICANN as well as a whole bunch of other websites. And then check the code or view the source. And again, all of this is written up under bit.ly slash fake websites. All right, we would love to take some questions <coughs> or comments. What I think we'll do is we'll, we'll give this mic out. Oh, you've got one, wonderful. So raise your hand if you have a question. Without that case study right now as well. Uh, good evening. Is there anything like a reverse video uh, search? Man, unfortunately not. Um, so there is one other tool that we didn't talk about that I'll mention in this context. Um, and it's called the YouTube Data Viewer. It's actually a tool that was built by Amnesty International. Um, so this is like the biggest challenge with video is because so many get scraped. Finding the original one is really hard, and there isn't an equivalent right now. But the YouTube data viewer um, is helpful because what it will do is, one, it will tell you the exact upload date and time of that YouTube video. But two, is that anytime you upload a video to YouTube or to another video site, it automatically is going to grab thumbnails. You know how when you come to a video, it's got the still image there? So it extracts the thumbnails that were uploaded for that particular YouTube video, and then you can run a reverse image search on those. And you may actually find that that leads you to other videos, earlier ones that have been uploaded, that the same thumbnail was, was, was generated for. So the YouTube data viewer is really useful for that. One other tip on YouTube for finding the first one um, is at the end of the YouTube URL, there's a, a string of numbers and letters. And if you copy that, and paste it into Twitter, into the basic search on Twitter, then you can see who's been sharing that YouTube video, and you might find the first person who shared it. Um, and that might tell you, again, like with the hoaxes or what have you, that might be the person who filmed the video, so maybe now you have their, their Twitter bio and you can try to reach out. Or it may actually surface that it's a suspicious account or what have you. So those are two tips for trying to find the origin of video. Um, that's YouTube Data Viewer, and then the other one is just copying that that unique code at the end of the URL for any YouTube video, popping that into Twitter um, and searching for that. Now there are other verification people in the room. Did I miss anything else as a tip on video? Anything else? I um, think the one other yeah. thing on video, especially finding it, is a lot of video ends up on YouTube but didn't necessarily originate there. So you can, if there's some descriptive elements, like if it is a video of a certain place at a certain time, you can take uh, those search terms either from the title or your own common sense of what this video might be about and search on Facebook. Maybe the video was originally uploaded to Facebook and then scraped and put on YouTube or Vimeo or some of the other services. But it's worth also checking because something might not originate. Even if you find the first person to share it on YouTube, it may not have originated there. Um, so just last thing since we're on the topic of video. First Draft has created, um, it's, so it's a, a pad, but also it has a verification guide for video. We have a few of these up here, so if you want to come grab one after, um, it's a step-by-step -step process to help you verify video, and it also has a guide for photos. And we also have a short version and of a the short version. Look at photos this. Look at and videos verification guide as well. So there we go, visual verification guide for photos. So come up and grab this stuff after. Um, it's a step-by-step -step guide and really, really useful and has been like reviewed by everybody in first draft, so it's, it's really good practices. Um, anyone else have a question or a comment? There's one in the back there. If you want to see if we can get the microphone. While the on. mic's going back there, I'll say, you know, verification is important on a, on a couple of realms. One, of course, is just we all want to get it right. But two is the reason that misinformation spreads out there, there's, there's lots of reasons why that might happen. It could be propaganda being put out for a certain purpose. It could be just mistakes that are being made. It could be what I like to call the sort of digital equivalent of the prank phone call. So it's a prank phone call for our age. Some people just like to see how many clicks and shares they can get by inserting themselves into a breaking news event. So all of these reasons, we need to make sure that we're verifying these things before they go out. And it has a button, hey. Um, it's a beautiful bridge to my question because um, what I couldn't get my head around was uh, with Brussels, for example, the Minsk video, um, why did it appear and, um, and why do people do that? Um, I think it is a small number of people that spread information like that. 
I'm not sure. I didn't do any research into that. Yeah. But would, would there be an option of um, identifying sources like that and then sharing them at least in our community yeah. to take them out of results, search results? So I haven't done formal research on the motivations of people who spread hoaxes, but as I mentioned, there, there are a few that come to mind. Uh, one is trying to insert a sort of political uh, issue into a breaking news event. So the fake eyewitness that I talked about uh, on Twitter during San Bernardino, they specifically went into this to actually try to sh make a point about the media. Specifically, they said they could get the media to blame any bad event on Gamergate, the sort of controversy around harassment online. Uh, and so they were trying to insert their political sort of cause into this breaking news event. Other times, it can be pure propaganda from a, um, from a, you know, a government source or other source that they're trying to insert in. Other times, it's really, like I said, a prank phone call type of thing where someone just thinks it'd be cool to see how far they could get something to spread. Um, Craig, I don't know, in the research you did with the Tau Center, did you, talk, did you find anything about motivations? Um, I didn't look at motivations as, uh, as much in that research, but another one that's really important for journalists to keep in mind is, and you sort of touched on it with the prank call thing, is people don't necessarily think about information and news the way journalists do, so sometimes they're just, like, it's entertainment for them. Um, and, and the other thing that's really important to also remember in the context of this is particularly when it comes to uh, natural disasters and other events that, where there's a lot of uncertainty, where there's fear, um, the reason that we create and spread rumors is to actually manage that uncertainty. So we try to come up, we fill in the blank spaces with possibilities and we talk about them because we're social creatures and we share them with people. And so people who, who create false rumors don't necessarily have malicious intentions. They're actually trying to make sense of a very difficult situation where there's a lot of fear. And that's, it's an important piece of context around breaking news. Um, some people are malicious, some people are just engaging in that human activity. Um, but to the, sort of the second part of your question, could we create some kind of universal list that everybody sort of knew who these sources were? Um, you know, th I think one of the challenges there is that the people who are actually dedicated to doing this, you know, will create new accounts and, and keep cycling. However, um, I, I have a list of fake news websites, um, which, you know, I should probably circulate a bit more. I actually sent it to Facebook to say, hey, why don't you stop letting these guys get shared so much? Um, and, uh, and so I think there are some where there's like dedicated ongoing fake websites, but for individuals, um, it's really tough because they just, they create new accounts, they cycle and they move on. Well, that makes me think of two things, Craig. One, to the fake websites piece, there's also a financial motivation here too. Right. Some of these fake news websites are commercial entities uh, who spread really, uh, you know, salacious or unbelievable or, or um, uh, stunning, surprising stories to get the clicks. And they're making tons of money off of that. And there's also Twitter accounts that do that too, that share just tons of information. Um, and there's a great Twitter account called Pick Pendant that you should check out. Um, I'll tweet that out in a second so you can get it. But um, they, this person just is dedicated to debunking these things. Um, but the other piece that I, I think is important is that there's the origination of the rumor and misinformation, and then there's the sharing of it. And a lot of times, faced with breaking news, people share because they, they want to help. They think, this is a really important piece of information, and, and I need to tell everybody about it. And so there's this emotional um, desire to help and an emotional desire to be part of a big event and to have a shared experience of that big event, which I think creates the impulse to share and Twitter and Facebook and others make it so easy to share that retweet button before we've even clicked through to check the URL or to see what it actually is, we might share it and that image of the Eiffel Tower lit up, you know, goes crazy or the Eiffel Tower going dark, I guess it was actually, um, when it, yeah. You know, so the, I think there's that piece of it too, that this, we, we can lean towards demonizing these things and especially when you get to the participant level, um, not the originator level, some people are just want to be part of something. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the research into rumors actually shows that the more critical a piece of information seems, the more likely someone is, is, is to repeat it. Because again, they think they're helping, they think they're serving. And so like the, a lot of the rumor studies have been done in like around earthquakes and other natural disasters. And people spreading these things aren't doing it maliciously. They're, they genuinely think they're helping and they're trying to kind of you know, deal with and manage a very difficult and fear-filled situation. I think there was another hand in the back, yeah. So now, okay, what's your thoughts on live streaming technologies that are coming up and verifying? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, it's an emerging area. Um, you know, I guess that my first thought is, uh, is that, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that, that applies to video verification in general uh, goes to that as well because, so where is this person? Um, what do you hear in terms of the voices? What are they saying about what they're seeing? As they walk around, do you see license plates? Do you see other things? So I think taking the visual cues to see if the person is where they say they are, that's like the first piece of it. Are they where they say they are? Um, is, and, uh, and then the second piece is, you know, you want to look at that person and their account. So what previous tweets do they have? Um, what can you sort of, what can you learn about them? And so those are two things that come to mind. Um, you know, I'll open up for anybody else from Josh or other from First Draft have really thought about this. I think like the emerging areas for verification challenges, like live video would be a good one. Messaging apps, because they're closed networks, is a really big verification challenge. Uh, and so those are two that I, I think they're emerging. And I'm pretty sure like bots are just going to get more advanced and it'll be more and more difficult to like, you know, there'll be some challenges around that. I mean, the only other thing I would say is, you know, where I worry about live streaming is really around the propaganda angle. When we look at the, um, how, how well some, some you know, organizations have gotten at pro producing videos that you could imagine them producing a live stream that was actually right. completely false. Uh, and, and so that's the sort of thing that we... Just like the moon landing, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so I think we're just about out of time. Uh, so we have some of these guides up here if you want to come up and grab one. We will tweet out, oh, people want them, okay, good. <laughs> we're also, we'll also tweet out a link to the presentation. And we'll tweet out a link to the verification guides too in case you don't get one. They are electronic Yeah, they're going versions. fast. This is good, people want it. Okay, thank you for coming.